Only one in five small and medium-sized businesses export, which suggests a huge untapped capacity for international business. If your product works here, ask yourself, could it work abroad? And the answer is probably yes. So what are the best ways to expand your business internationally? Let's hear from some people who have done just that. Will, you're CEO of Brompton Bikes. You're now manufacturing, what is it, 45,000 bikes a year. And you're the UK's largest bike manufacturer, selling to 45 countries. Pretty impressive. What's been the key to your success, or the expansion over the last 15 years, would you say? So, <coughs> in the early days, we, we, we weren't even thinking about export. We were just obsessed with making a great product that people might want to use. Mm. Luckily for us, the product's quite small, so people came and worked in London, or they were visiting, they picked up one of these bikes, took it home, then they're like going around showing all their friends, and then their friends are going, this is cool, and then some friend goes, yeah, but no one's selling them here, well, maybe we should try and sell them. People oh, what, got in third touch with parties us. looked at selling them for you? Yeah, just friends of somebody who happened to buy it, and then they got right. in touch, and anyone selling in our country, can we sell them? Can we import them? Oh, right, so it's so like a franchise, or...? In the very early days, it was distributors. We distributors. weren't interested, it was really basic, and, and these people got in touch with us, and we were so flattered that anyone was prepared to, to want to buy our product. We went, yippee, on you go, no contracts. So no research, you didn't look at and say... No, well. no, 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 <laughs> completely just made the things, shoved them out the door, pro forma. But sort of how many, how many did you shove out the door to people? I mean, so well, give me a country, give me an example of numbers. Yeah, sort of 15, 20%. And then we realised we were onto something. Right. And then we started realising that we started. We had time to think about a strategy and what we might do. And strategy is always good after the event, isn't it? Yes, <laughs> I, could, I, I know. I'm all for strategy after the event. You spend too much time worrying about strategies. So. Yeah, sometimes you can get you can get overstressed. What about yes. you? You, twenty years now that you've been looking at uh, international expansion. Well, you're the one who's sort of pushed it in the family, didn't you? Mm. How, how did you go about it? Well, our story was a bit interesting because when we started to export, uh, well... So cakes, we're, we're talking about cakes here, Yeah, right? yeah, cakes, so handmade cakes. Um, but when we uh, started looking at export markets, we were only two years into our business. So we, we, had just, we, have, we hadn't even started nationally. Uh, we were just doing it, things on a regional level. My father and my uncle were yeah. mainly... And what we used to do, because we, we knew that there was probably potential for a handmade cake abroad, because if there's a potential for a handmade luxury item in the UK, these kind of markets can be uh, found abroad. So my father and I would work Monday to Friday, um, once a month, we, it was back then, we used to pick just once a month, we'd f uh, pick a location, we'd go to that location for the weekend. Internationally? Internationally. So just give me an example of one that you did. Well, the Sorry. first place that we went to was Lisbon. Right. Portugal. And what, market store? Uh, no, um, we actually flew out on a Friday, uh, spent all day Saturday buying cakes from the Portuguese Lisbon supermarkets, taking them back to our hotel, taking pictures of those cakes, recording them, uh, the competition versus ours, creating a detailed report. We'd go around asking the shopkeepers, the coffee shop people, you know, where do you buy your cakes from? So understanding the supply Being chain, the, the wholesalers, important. And we'd get this really key information, you know, the retail price, the wholesalers, map out the supply chain. We'd do that Saturday, Sunday, and then Monday we'd visit an exhibition out there as well, mm. trade exhibition. Oh, cool. So, so we'd quite proactive, quite yeah. different from the way that you've done it, Will, which was an organic, well, someone go, we'll sell that. Different, what, similar. Different, of course. And Jen, what about you? How did yours start? Stitch and sew. Stitch and story. Stitch and story. Yeah. So this is about knitting, isn't it, in a bag, and you, t you, you guide people on how to knit, you know, yeah. like a lost craft. So how, how did you go about expanding that internationally? Um, I guess we've always known that the US market was uh, such a big boom for crafting. Um, and for us, it was quite important to start locally. Um, and obviously that's in the UK for us. Of course. And so we wanted to make sure that um, we knew how to do our trade shows. We built our own website and we also built our brand following. And you were already thinking, we want to take this internationally. Exactly. We so we had that in the mind. Right, yeah. Right, right. Um, and then so then once we've kind of got that, um, all those three in place, um, we realised that we were building this amazing brand story which was um, what we packaged and wanted mm. to kind of replicate over to the US. And so 
with that, we we started doing trade shows just last year. And, this, and cause, because the internet obviously gave you a huge, any small business, I bet you've all knew the internet's mm -hmm. been wonderfully vital and cost effective yeah. in getting out there. But how did you connect globally? Was it trade shows? How did you connect with the potential buyers, like the big retailers? It would be um, our strong social media presence right. and also um, doing trade shows as well. Right. So it's the pairing and um, again, like you're tying in the whole brand story and then they start understanding what your brand is and then thinking, you know, what, thinking more about it. So, yeah. And that's how you connect with them. So if you've got a question for today's guest on exporting, use the hashtag Spotlight Sessions. Gurdip, you're one of the UK's leading manufacturers of case. So how did you pick decide which countries to focus on. I know you did your research, and you're out there with your dad doing all these different places, but was it the first one that came and said, we'll take it, or was it a specific goal that you went after a particular country knowing there was a gap? Um, well, we obviously looked at the gaps where uh, we could get maximum for our product, mm -hmm. so where the maximum retail prices are, where oh, right. we, we didn't need to adapt and change the product so much. So for example, uh, out of the 500 or so products that we produce muffin is one of those ranges and muffin and cookies and cupcakes are very universal so they go into yeah. multi markets so we'd probably pick uh, we used to pick markets uh, that would take that type of product and have it on a mass market in their market the price of that would be quite high um, and also importantly back then we used to look at um, markets where the free trade agreement existed right so the app right. products wouldn't be taxed so much so it's it's in the EU in other words and what would be your biggest problem though when you went global what were the what were the key kind of issues we thought oh. Well, I wish I'd known that. There, there was loads because you can imagine we're doing Keep one of the most. Keep them to a few for me. Let's, we want people <laughs> we're, to feel. We're, we're, we're they exporting can do cake, the most fragile yeah, 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 thing, uh, product that you can imagine. So um, things like supply chain, ma yep. making sure that we're selecting the right partners as well who understand our industry, our market, yep. who have the infrastructure in place. And then it's all the rest of the sort of things as well, making sure you select the right partners who understand your brand, who yeah. put your brand at the right level, the right marketing, values, of the, brand the right values, etc. Et and did you have that, Will? I mean, what would you say to SMEs? I mean, what would you think was the most important thing that they need to really think about before exporting? It, I, I'm with Gerdy all the way. Mm. In the early days, things happened naturally. Then yeah. we decided we needed to do it strategically. And at that point, we started traveling. And I really, would caution against people over strategizing, doing tons of research, worrying about import this and get out there, visit people, find out when there's a trade show, yeah. mm. meet people. And you and culturally feel, don't you, the energy yes. of a place when you actually physically go there. And you may quickly yeah. find out that actually your assumption was wrong. Yes. And this is a complete mm -hmm. no, not, not for you, in which case very quickly, don't waste any more time. Here. Or you'll go back and think, oh, this is great. Yeah. It's got loads of potential. Yeah. Then you start doing your research and then you can get the help from all sorts of organisations, from you know, UKTI, embassies, banks, start doing your research. And for us, in the early days, it was about taking our time to find people who didn't promise the earth, but cared, and yeah. we meant something yeah. to them. Yeah. And they weren't some massive mm -hmm. distributor, and we were the latest fad. We were a sort of big fish for them, and yes. they then really bought into our so the right so partners the right yeah. partners that yeah. you work. what about you Jen what was the first thing that you implemented when you went um, to export we probably implemented um, a, just doing the trade shows I think it was yeah. that was the strategy for how did you know to pick who were the right partners that were buying your product or it would be because yours is about very much image as well isn't it this craft and it's a cool brand yeah it's yeah. about how it's fitting into the shop floor and who is the audience and doing that research and also it's it's building that relationship with the buyer as well yes. and um, Trust. trusting them that they will carry that brand I mean we've got a really high profile client mm. um, in US right now and it's they they believe in us and that's that's all that you need in a sense and mm. um whether whether your product is uh you know they will carry your product basically yeah. because yeah. they believe yeah. in the founders in a way yeah and do you think we're bullish enough i mean you know when we go internationally with our products do you think we are bullish enough when we go out there because uh, often one feels oh i'm really happy that you're buying my product yeah, yeah. But, you know <laughs> well, are we bullish enough because i find the americans are really bullish Was I, it you? Go yeah, on. I find that um british um the way that we are as yeah. british people are, we're very like modest and very like calm and mm. but when you go to the american market and they are just <laughs> another level <laughs> 
<laughs> and it's, it's a really great energy, I think. And you yeah. just bounce off with it. And then you just come back to the UK and you're just like, you know what, I'm just going to bring that energy just back. Mm, and it, yeah. it helps you grow and develop as a person as well. Yeah. And, and go to your product, did you have to change or tweak it, you know, to go into an international market? I mean, you know, did you have to English buy it or British buy it? Is that the right words? I don't know. <laughs> but you know what I mean. Yeah, yeah. Did you have to to make it... To sell more, did you have to change it, packaging, anything? Yeah, of course. I mean, I mean, the, what? But you wouldn't. You say you, of course, but you wouldn't on Brompton Bikes. But funny enough, we did too. Oh, did you? And yeah. we okay. did too as well. Oh. Because with our product, we th in the in Europe, the bike is a tool. People yeah. use it to get around. They're covered in mud. They're covered in dirt, and they just whack them here and they use them every day, and that's what they were designed for. And when we first went to Japan, we turned up. And they were, looked like they clearly didn't like them because there wasn't a spot of dirt on them. They were all polished. They looked like they were brand new. And they weren't using them as a mode of transport at all. They were using them a completely different way. It was used only at the weekends. It was for showing off to your friends. And then they dingle dangled little toys and teddy bears on them. And then they'd go off and have a meal and the take lots of photographs. The big cultural differences that yes. you had to so understand. So then we've developed the product to have yeah. more, more personalization yeah. and it's, it's evolved. And go to yours. What were your tips then? On, yeah, on, on I mean, appealing to a different consumer base. We we had to obviously design because we personalise our cakes anyway, so we can personalise the cakes, flavour, the packaging. But what we had per, to do per country, per country. Yeah, okay. Um, so Scandinavia, they have all kinds of strange tastes that we had to make um, for, for those guys <laughs> no who won't go into it. No, no. Um, but what we had to do generally, because we had so much competition, because cake is cake as well, yeah. you know, there's local producers, we had to come up with really inno innovative brands that speak, you know, the, say the British brand. So we came up with brands like the English Cake Company, where we created our own retail concept to go directly to the consumers, educate the consumers. Right. And just like our Will was saying as well, people would take our cake, the English Cake Company, and they'd show it off, you know, as, as a special treat. They'd say, wow, <laughs> handmade in England, yes. it says and it all And gifting and so gifting. forth, take it around to people. And, and what about that? What about the, the union, Jack? Because I've read somewhere that, you know, increases sales by just having that. Do you use it on your packaging? Do you use it on yeah. your packaging? And if you use it on? Definitely. British, we, we say made in London. So. You say made in London, yeah. that's interesting. Yeah, so. For crafting, yeah. but, but what about the Union Jack? Can you use it anywhere? Can you so, just put so yeah, it you, on? You can, we, we, we have a teeny weeny Union Jack yeah. on our bike. And funny enough, we had some fake ones being made in Taiwan. They had an enormous <laughs> Union Jack all over their bike, oh. and theirs was the fake. But for us, we're very proud to be British. we made in London. But if you sort of overplay it, to me, You've got to compete with anyone in the world. If your product isn't better value than anyone made anywhere, yeah, then and you start yeah. thinking, well, the only reason that you're paying a premium is because it's British. Is, yeah. The consumer You're won't not going to survive. No. And talking about that, you know, when you're working internationally and you've got people working for you, how yeah. do you ensure that the cultural values mm. of your business? I mean, you said the one that's the rip-off by <laughs> the big union jack yeah. on it. But how do you manage that? Because that's really important that you get yeah. like-minded people and partners. So we've now got offices, um, about eight offices around the world. I mean, we say office, it sounds grand. It's some two people in some tiny little, you know. Little an office, place. well, let's talk it, big here. Let's take, a, mm -hmm. let's take a tip for the Americans. Yeah. It's an office. It's an office. But we tend to start by sending our own staff out there. So we, we will take staff who've been with us for five or seven years and say, listen, do you want to do something wild and go and live in Hong Kong or move out to New York? So you're taking your DNA and stuffing it into a new territory. And then we do lots of events and we fly people. Richard's just been over. We're really keen on flying them to us and flying over to them and, you know, drinking beer, having a laugh and connecting, remembering. Really yeah, connecting. You've got to spend time. So where do you think of the new exciting markets? You, you, you talked to me about, you were telling me about, was it Libya that you went into? <laughs> no, it was a really huge market suddenly, wasn't it? For well, you? it was actually Malta. We were the market leaders at one point in Malta. We had the whole market share there. We had products and brands. Did they not bake cakes at all in Malta? Well, they, they're reliant <laughs> on it. Imports, especially when it comes down to branded yeah. uh, cakes like the Chelsea Bakery, English Cake Company, our brands. But where our sales really went high in Malta was when 
uh, the war happened in Libya and uh, there was changes happening there. You know, Gaddafi was overthrown and then the whole Libyan market opened up. Then loads of Libyans decided to become importers because they had yeah. free trade. Great. So they would come so over. You wouldn't have seen that coming. You no, seen no that. way. Political What about for you, Jane? What, what great exciting markets have you seen? Or um, you think it's coming up and you think, God, I want to get in there. I think it might be China just because, um, you course. know, the UK has now uh, approved RMB to be like one of the yeah. foreign exchange. That little country. Yeah. Well, we couldn't do a show without talking about Brexit, of course. Um, and so lots of Telegraph um, readers are asking, with uncertainty over Brexit, should we be looking beyond Europe in the first instance when planning an export strategy? Are you all worried? Are you all sitting there going, yeah? No, I, I just think it's totally overrated. I mean, you? when you're in a small business, you want to worry about what you're in control of. Yeah. So uh, we've just developed an electric bike. We've opened a shop in Greenwich Village in, in Manhattan. We've, we're just restructuring our offices in China. Th that's something we're in control of. Some Brexit thing with a load of politicians, let them worry about it. it, it we're not in control. Suddenly, it's a 10% WTO. Who gives a stuff that the exchange rate has dropped 15% and a teeny weeny bit of paperwork? We're doing paperwork all over the world. Yeah. So, so I you would think still it's just going to be a bit more paperwork? Yeah. A little bit more paper, but the Europe is so easy. It's on our doorstep. You can hop on a train, mm. definitely yeah. pile in yeah. there. Don't start being over ambitious yes. and going into, as we, as yeah. we spoke, you know. Straight into China or America. So what yeah. about you, Godi? You, you worried about it? Or do you think there's issues that people should be worried about? No, I mean, because we've actually expanded. We've built a brand new factory because of Brexit. Traditionally, there was a lot of imported cake and factory coming in from the EU. And now we've taken that market share organically. So a lot of the supermarkets, nice coffee shops, mm. there, we're dealing with them more. OK, a recent report, another Telegraph, from the Federation of Small Businesses found that 29% of companies expected to export less after Brexit. Do you think that, guys? No. No, absolutely no. not. Oh, good. No, yeah. That fills me with such joy. That really does. Thank you. Um, Jen, thank you for joining us today, because Will and Gerdy are going to stay with me. And we're going to continue the conversation with David Salter, who is Head of Funded Trade Finance at NatWest. And don't forget, you can find plenty more advice, insight and information on exporting on the NatWest Business Hub. Soon to arrive on that very hub is the story of Halto, an import and export company set up by two sisters, Lerin and Lucy, with a very big idea for a very little product. Halto came about by complete accident. My sister was going away on holiday, she really wanted to wear a Halto night bikini and they are notoriously uncomfortable. I ended up fashioning myself something out of a bit of old neoprene and a shoe sole, took it on holiday and it worked brilliantly. We manufacture the product overseas, but everything else happens across the dining room table once the kids have gone to bed. The product is made in Hong Kong, it's manufactured out there and packaged, so we get the complete product delivered to the UK. The business has grown phenomenally. We've sold over 15,000 units to over 40 countries. Working with my sister has been brilliant. We never thought that we could work together, but we've got such complementary skill sets and we've worked really well. We've really enjoyed it. I love that little <laughs> product idea. Um, David, you're the head of funded trade finance at NASWest and have most SMEs, I suppose, coming to you. But what's the most frequently asked question that, when it comes to exporting from SMEs? Um, I, I think, to be honest with you, we talk to our customers a lot about exporting. And I think um, the things that they fear most about exporting over the last few years tends to be the same things, the, ten, the same sort of three or four things. It firstly starts with, you know, am I going to get paid? How can I ensure I get paid when yeah, I'm working yeah. with someone I don't know? How do I operate in markets uh, that I've not done before? I don't understand. And also just a general lack of knowledge about international trade. But I have to say, Mary, that there's never been a better time at the moment to start exporting because there is an absolute abundance of advice, of help and support out there on the government website. Exporting is great, uh, uh, the Institute of Exports website. And also go along to your bank because many of our local managers are, are really sort of up on the subject too. OK, lots of questions coming in on this from SMEs. I mean, the number one one is what should I worry about? Um, I think, to be honest... Uh, or what should be my first concerns, you know, really think about Yeah, I, th I think it's the getting paid thing, to be honest with you. But I think, mm. you know, it's also researching the right market. Um, you know, there's two ways to get into exporting. You know, we've heard a few different stories so far today. One is a more proactive way. You kind of sit back and think, well, what market should I be in? But the vast majority of businesses, that doesn't happen. You know, well, these guys do get out there. Absolutely. I mean, researching the market yeah. is getting out there it, it as is well, get, isn't it? It is. Yeah. And yeah. it doesn't have to be costly, does it? No. Uh, 
No. We have, we have <laughs> a weird Airbnb thing. Airbnb or we have a breakfast. We have a weird thing where people are happily go to Mexico for their holidays, yeah. but they can't export to France. Yeah, that's yeah. intimidating. Yeah. And it's like, no, 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 just, just get on and get going. Yeah. But there is no substitute, as you said earlier, Will, for um, getting out there, living and breathing, seeing the customers you're going to be exporting to, really understanding the culture. And, and, and there are and trade food. shows for tiddlywinks, cakes, bicycles. You yeah, know, there yeah, are yeah. trade shows it's everywhere. There. It's there. What you're saying is the information is there. Absolutely, it? it's there. Huge amount of it. And is there any countries that you don't feel it's worth exporting to? Either so, of you? So we, we had to do a, a sort of... A, a, a toss-up between China and India. Two great mm -hmm. opportunities, mm -hmm. which one do we go for? Lots of thinking, well, maybe we should go for India, cultural heritage, language, much better. But in the end, we went to China because of infrastructure. You know, mm -hmm. in India, you're, you're going to be going through potholes and dodging cows. <laughs> yeah. And in China, for our product, which is a bicycle, they've got lots of cycle lanes. It's come with lots of other challenges, but we, we can't do everything yeah. at once, and yeah. you've got to take them one at a time. OK, David, question. Uh, how do I pull together an export strategy. Where well, do I start on that? Okay, so, so look, there's a range of good export templates on some of the sites I talked about a little bit earlier, Open to Export and uh, the government's uh, Department for International Trade website. I mean, think largely about um, legislation, because some of the places you're going to be exporting to will have local product testing regulations and things, which you need to prove that your product meets. So it's very, very wise to look up local regulations, but also think about how you're going to get your product there. We heard earlier about transport and things. Yep. Sometimes you can use the likes of of, you know the normal careers like UPS or, or DHL but there are specialist companies out there called freight forwarders who will do far more for you so they will help you to clear customs and things like that mm. and explain to me what is trade finance exactly what so, the, so trade finance, I suppose, is quite a broad term, but the vast majority of SMEs in the UK fund their trade for, or their, their trading activity through an overdraft. Many of them don't realise that there are specialist products that the high street banks uh, uh, provide, such as export loans and invoice discounting, that sometimes are actually more efficient for funding their trading activity than just using an overdraft. And Gurdi, do you ever have you ever gone into a, a, a country and thought this is too much competition? This is just not worth our while in here. Because often competition is a good thing, isn't it? Of course it is. Yeah, I mean, I Has there been countries where you thought, nah? Uh, I ask myself that each time we go to any market. <laughs> but there's certain markets, you're right, that we do feel more competition. And that's where we've had to be much more strategic and yeah. go against that competition. We've created our own retail brands like the English Cake Company, which are our own yeah, bakery yeah, yeah. shop, coffee shops, yeah. educate the consumer, give the consumer uh, you know, that feel. So the, uh, the, it, it comes from consumer-driven and then we get to get involved with the trade. We tell the retailers, look, consumers are buying our product. Here's our range, et cetera, et cetera. And David, one of the big questions that keeps coming in from yeah. the SMEs is how do I control risk? That's a very common question. There's a couple of things there. Firstly, people worry about the welfare of their goods. They're transporting further away for the first time. And what do they have to think about? One of the things I would say, it sounds a bit technical, but definitely worth looking up is the term INCO terms. It stands INCO for... INCO terms. INCO terms. It I-N-C-O. That's right. It stands for International Commercial Terms. It's right. really worth knowing because basically there are 11 of these INCO terms. And what they define is who's going to pay for the insurance while the goods are in transit right. and who pays for the transport. So it's right. wise, obviously, if your goods go astray in, in, in transit, it's worth knowing who's obviously responsible for yes. that. So that's the first thing. Second thing, as we said earlier, one of the big biggest worries of SMEs when exporting is payment, getting paid. And therefore, um, definitely worth asking your bank, go to them and ask about ways to mitigate that risk. Because there are a lot of people out there that don't realise that banks have products such as letters of credit and documentary collections, which sound complex, but all they're there to do is to ensure you get paid. So are those are ways of guaranteeing that you get paid? The, is there any certainly minimising a lot risk. of the risk. Because the thing is, when you first start exporting for a lot of customers, they kind of feel like they should uh, export in the same way as they sell in the UK, which is fine. But the vast majority of, of people who, who export when they first start, they effectively send their goods abroad and they hope they get paid. And of course, in the vast majority of cases, I'm sure they do, but sometimes it's better to think, are there tools out there that right. the banks can offer to, to help? OK, a Telegraph reader asks, my company still has plenty of scope for domestic expansion. At what point should I consider overseas? You were quite early on your expansion mm -hmm. overseas, weren't you? And I guess Jen yeah. was. And you were so relatively we were early. early. What do you think, guys? Yeah. So for us, we, we had a situation where we had a 16-week lead time for our bikes in the UK. So we couldn't supply demand in the UK, but we started developing export because we knew that the incubation period for our product 
is quite long. It takes two or three years for it to get going. And we knew that in two or three years, because we were investing in our production capability, we wouldn't have enough customers. So we started developing the export markets quite a long time before we needed them to give them time to nurture and develop so that then in three years, the export kicked off and we had those sales to support the growth. Right. So you've got to look forward right. a bit. And David, we're not just talking product here as well. We're, we're talking services as well. I mean, there's a lot of incredible services that come out of this country that can be exported. Talk Abs to me about that. Absolutely. So, so banks are well equipped and, and all the professional organisations that help businesses in this country are well equipped to help people to export expertise and services. I think we are still the ninth, it's, it's weird, isn't it? The ninth biggest manufacturing uh, economy in the world, but our biggest industry is the service industry. And do you know what? If you're exporting service instead of exporting products, a lot of the same things apply uh, certainly the products at the bank we can uh, finance that kind of activity and also you know the same kind of risks apply there so oh, the same advice interesting stat now if you want to know more about exporting there's loads of information tips and insights available on the NatWest business hub where you can also see other spotlight sessions on subjects such as cyber security and marketing thank you all for joining me today that was really interesting and next time we're going to be talking cash flow and managing late payments